Sholem Aleichem, Assalam Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. I hope everyone is having an excellent Passover. So how are things going? The Boondist Movement. And the Black Panther Party. Revolution has come of the big time to pick up the gun of the big revolution has come of the big time to pick up the gun of the big revolution has come of the big time to pick up the gun of the big Steve Struggle, how are you doing today? Pretty good, thanks. So, Steve Struggle, you um, you were with the original Black Panther Party. Yes, I was. That is so cool. Right on. And I take it you have agreed to answer some questions for our, our organization? Sure. No problem. Cool, cool. I'm going to actually start with the chairman's questions. Sure. Uh, we would, uh, on behalf of Dr. Weisfeld, we would, um, and uh, we confirmed this question, uh, we would like to know if uh, it can be recognized that the Jewish people are a national minority. Um, I, I mean, within, within the USA? Uh, well, yes, yes, basically within the USA. I would, uh, well, I mean, where, where I would say it, I would say yes, but I mean, I, I don't, I guess... I guess because I'm, I see things a little bit differently, but not totally differently. I, I mean, I say yes, but they're also part of um, part of uh, humanity. So I don't see them as a minority. I see them as part of humanity. Now, with, you know, within the U.S., you know, that's probably accurate. But I don't see it. I don't see the Jewish people as a minority. I see them as part of the world community. Okay, cool. Um, and, and that sort of applies to Canada as well. But I, I'm, I'm not. I'm guessing that you um, are not part of that social sphere. And actually, I like your your answer. That's a pretty good. Seeing us all as part of humanity. That's uh, that's yeah. a good answer. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I, think, I think that's really the way you have to see see because there's going to be different sections within each each group, community, people, nation, people. And um, you know, the fact that people are living within the United States is just I mean, that's kind of just the way it is right now, I mean, because, I mean, the way historically things have turned out. Because I think, like, if people see African Americans as a, well, they, they, they came out of Africa, and they were enslaved, and oh my, then it takes away from the humanity of, like, of African people. So, I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I just want to put that clear, that I've, I've kind of grown in that, in my thinking, in that area, I, I, I think. Um, but the next question would be, uh, would the, would the Jewish people, would you say, are considered to be subject to racism in the form of anti-Semitism, you know, as we're misconstrued as a racial ethnic group when we are not? And we often, like, a good example of this would be Jewish black people are often not recognized even by other Jewish people because of the, the, the way that we've developed an ignorance problem since the Holocaust and we've allowed other people to define us instead of us defining us anymore. Basically, would you say that we're, we're, we're the subject of discrimination in uh, your view? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. And is there a possible alliance of Jewish people in the United Front of oppressed nationalities apart from an alliance with some Jewish people? Uh, what do you mean? I don't understand what you mean. Would you say, uh, okay, you know, like Fred Hampton's Rainbow Coalition? Do you think that yeah, something like yeah. that is possible again? Oh, I, I think it's very possible. It's, it's, it's actually necessary. We we need something like that to kind of clear up. It, it, it would kind of get things right on a certain level, as far as how different forces should can ally or or should or should ally. Right on, right on. Um, is there a? All right. So, our our national is national oppression and class oppression related, and how would you say so if it is related? Well, I mean, okay. 
Let me put it like this. I, at least within the context of the United States, when you say national oppression, you're talking to me what people would call that is racism, even though it's not racism, but that's what it's called in the within the words that we use in common conversation. So I would say, oh, hell yes. The, the issue is that within that nation or that community of people, different social classes exist and they have they're different they push for different the 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 they push for different goals goals within their social class the problem is that within that higher within that community and nation there's hierarchy of the african american bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie over the black mass and the poor and there's there's struggle between those classes so and also the, the 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 members of that nation live and work within U.S. imperialism, so the class character of U.S. imperialism is going to impact the class character of their relationship between each other and to imperialism. So I think, it, I mean, different situations have different histories, as so far as how the class, how the national class questions uh, interact. But that's kind of how I see it within the confines of the U.S. A with regard to African Americans. All right, and uh, the next one is uh, how is Zionism to be considered in your view? Uh, how is Zionism to be considered in class and revolutionary terms? I mean, uh, we would say it was rea is reactionary, but you have other people say it's revolutionary, and you know how would you resolve the, the this? In okay. Your mind? Okay. So. Let me say this. One day I was watching a TV show. I saw a Jewish, a Jewish gentleman say the reason we have Israel is that nobody can walk by and say, hey, 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 Jew boy, and start fucking with me. Okay. Well, I mean, that was a very, there's more to the Zionism than that idea, but this is what one can't say. And I, I, I can identify with that, with that, but what I'm saying is, at this point, why are we gotta have everybody separated up? I don't get the point of it. Unless, you just, unless historically you gotta have that, I think we should live. We should have communities of communities of peoples within within what they call states. And I don't see why the this, why I don't I don't support the Zionist movement. I think it's really utterly reactionary to say that I'm an anti-Semite because of that. That's why it became become a thing with the, with the, the anti BDS um, campaign by the imperialists. Would call say I'm I, I'm anti Semite, which that's not true, or is it? And it's not I, true. I, 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 I just don't see I don't see how that, that project really works. Now, something I did learn from your video, I think it was your video, that people left <laughs> left Germany and went to Palestine. Uh, deal with the Nazis. Or this is I think it was in your video. Yes, um, yes. Uh, the Zionists and the Nazis yeah. were in fact complete cahoots. Right, with each other. right. So, so when I see and hear that, it makes me just wonder what the hell is really going on historically. Because, um, you know, but no, I, I don't see Zionism as being a progressive movement. I mean, a, a, a revolutionary movement, a progressive movement. Um, it, this whole two-state solution shit. You know, I have a whole. I mean. On the one hand, I want to tell, I want to say, the Zionists, what's wrong with you? You can't live with Arab people and be equals and have, you know, one one person, one one voter for Palestinian people. On the other hand, you know, um, you look at how you look at the West Bank, you look at Gaza. You know, I mean, this 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 is nothing but um, apartheid, settler colonialism, really deep racism, and. Um, an attempt to commit cultural genocide against those peoples, because that's the way your videos really show the abusive police nature of the Israeli Defense Force. It's one of you have ever seen. It really shows what they're about. That yeah, video and really show the, the how they approach the Palestinian and Arab peoples. Yeah, right there. Yeah, right on, right on. So, um, in relation to this uh, question, I suppose you would say, would you say that Zionism is racism then, in that sense, or like, I, I understand what you say about the term racism because yeah, uh, racism yeah. is 
you know, yeah, in the, in the sense of Zionism being a form of class and national oppression, yes. Yep, true. Definitely, and we agree with you. Um, and it's not just Bundists. Like, you'll notice that the rabbis were in that video, too, and they consider it racism as well. And we, we are proud to say those are our rabbis. Dr. Weisfeld, this wasn't in the documentary, but Dr. Weisfeld uh, had interviewed um, uh, that very year. He interviewed uh, Rabbi Hirsch's son, who is now the current uh, rabbi, chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and they still, to this day, do not recognize Israel. Uh, they identify, in fact, as Palestinian. Um, yeah, yeah, the whole thing is just the whole thing. The whole thing is just so obnoxious and disgusting. The whole, the whole, that whole, that whole movement, everything about them is just utterly fucked up. You got the, <laughs> I mean, they even they even have fucking nuclear weapons. Where's the outrage about that shit? Fuck North Korea. The hell with the DPRK. They ain't got nothing compared to Israel. Hell. No. I know, and, and, I know. Israel can do anything it wants. It's not, if I, as I understand it, it's not, it doesn't even comply with these treaties. So fucking leave. The DPR, that's, that's just, that's just political oppression. The anti, the, the anti, that's how they operate, man. They put it like, this is what they do. They, they oppose you from a class perspective, straight up. And then the politics is organized by these imperialist states within that context. But then they would like, for example, the DPRK. So they come at them, oh, you, you're doing this. Oh, you're doing this. You know what? They may have a nuclear program. You know what? They may be trying to hit the United States with weapons. So what? That's not even the point. So Israel's doing the same. That's, that, that's, the, that's the same shit within that area. Israel's part of that same neck. Like all them weapons they got, man. The, each, I mean, the Palestinians have like, every right to develop the same, the same capacity against Israel. What they have is nothing. They're fighting a people's war, man. Israel got airplanes. It, uh, they, uh, the Palestinians don't have no airplanes. No, they, 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 they have drones, but not airplanes. The drones, not airplanes. I mean, not airplanes, not an army that can come over you, bomb you, cut off your water, do what they want to you. No, they don't have nothing like that. So Israel, fuck that DPRK oppression. Israel got all them bombs, man. I'll tell you something. That's a hell of a hypocrisy. All them bombs Israel had, you were talking about the DPRK. What the hell? That's just a fake. That that's just a false flag right there. That's bullshit. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Right on. You're keeping it real. I love it. I love it. Um, so, would you say that the state of Israel is Jewish or Zionist? Like I said, these are these are general questions that um, the chairman wants to know. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's uh, is it Jewish or Zionist? Right now, it's Zionist. Now, that's what I see Israel as right now. And, and then they try to put the cover of they put the cover of Judaism on the uh, Zionism, just like uh, the imperialists put the cover of, of patriotism for blindly going along with the domestic policy and foreign policy of the capitalists and and their governments. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're definitely a Zionist state with a with a Jewish cover. Right on, right on. Yes, they're they're using us as human shields, basically. To, and, we, and then and like when um, I'm not the biggest fan of Barack Obama, but I sided with him over Netanyahu, at least in the. I mean, it's it's just watery words that he was using to meet the former president. But what was bizarre to me is he stood up Netanyahu. Remember when he came to Congress and he stood up as if you know he was the president himself. And he was basically saying, you better watch out, Mr. President, because I represent the Jewish people all over the world. And we, we actually did get anti-Semitic attacks just for that. And <laughs> despite the – I mean, you would even have certain um, embarrassing, you know, right-wing Jewish people in here who oppose that even. I mean, the fact that the ADL was against that, which to me the ADL tends to be a little bit more right-wing and not always in the best interest of Jewish people. But they were against this. And if they were against that – I mean, I, I, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just insane, you know. Um, I mean, I take it you remember that, you know, Netanyahu did that great big speech, and you know, he pretty much was trying to, you know, tell the president, you know, you better watch out because, you know, everybody supports me, you know, even though his support is even declining within his own country, just, you know, um, which is neither here nor there to, for me as far as I can see, because his opposition wasn't that much better. Um, but um, the next question would be: Is a united front a uh, 
which by the way in panther term analogy would be a rainbow coalition is would you say that this is a uh, a, a, pr a precursor to a constitutional assembly um it could be it could be sure and uh what is the purpose of a party formation and it is is it more pro important in a united front now i'm guessing that this is a reference to vanguard party um <coughs> didn't get a chance to clarify that with dr weisfeld what he meant by party formation but i'm, I'm guessing he's referring to a vanguard party so the question uh, i mean i'm hoping that i'm uh, not I, you, know, here. you know what you know what let me tell you something Without a mass movement, you really can't grow a revolution. You can't grow. You can't grow anything without large numbers of people. So, to, the, to a certain extent, I'm probably going to break rank here and say, without a mass movement, you can't really develop a. Uh, you can't really develop a vanguard party. But vanguard elements are going to be the ones who. Okay, here's vanguard. Vanguard elements should set. The goal help to set the goals and the, and the slogans and the direction and the orientation of a mass movement. So in that sense, you need you need to have vanguard elements, vanguard parties, however you want to term what term you want to use. But without people who want to move, the party won't grow. And the case in point is right now with DSA and that whole shit that's going on with them. The void of the the, the void of the of the opposition to Trump and the um, I was in Trump, the midterm elections, the Mueller report, all that shit that's going on. And also the anti-immigrant, the anti-immigrant movement of, 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 of the Trump wing and the government. With all that going on, that's why DSA grows. I'm not saying DSA is a vanguard party. They're not. They're a reactionary organization. They're for, they're, they're for the Democrats. And they suck in young people in, in mostly, this, they suck in people into their orbit um, because people are outraged, and w people are outraged, and, a, and a, in some in some areas of struggle are are willing to move. So DSA was there; they they existed so they could then grow off of that mass movement. So you have to have a party <coughs> or vanguard pole that attracts people's attention. Oh, that's stands for something within the movement that stands for something and when there's a movement they're part of that movement and they still stand for the same thing but the movement may die and may, may be destroyed or may fall apart or wither away but the party still needs to be there so the party can't go away as 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 movements ebb and flow a party can't ebb they have to just flow they have to come kind of, they have to push on flowing okay cool cool well, we uh we form what's called a vanguard circle. I mean, we're, we're we need um we need three more. We have a new member here, and we're and, uh, we need three more. But the way the vanguard circle works is that the the three founders, myself, Dr. Weisfeld, and Donna Newman, we we form basically the uh, the triad uh, theoretical command, um, and then we have the five council members under us, and we're supposed to have under them uh, four ministry members who. Then technically we would answer to those four, so it's, it works like a circle. Because what we do is we come up with the basis of the theory. The council flushes it out, tries to make it more um, material, you know, and then they hand it to the ministry, and the ministry puts it into action. And then they come back to us, and they say, okay, well, what you did here, what you were proposing here, totally worked, but what you tried to, us, to get us to do over here doesn't work at all. And, and that's the theory of our vanguard. We call it a vanguard circle as opposed to a party, but. It technically does fit the role of a vanguard party, but what's what I hope you'd be delighted here is I agree with you about mass movements being important because it's really the people that do it, not not um, not the leadership. Because the leadership is is there to educate, from what I've understood, um, and to uh, help explain certain things. Um, but um, that that took a while for us to come up with the concept of the vanguard circle. Yeah, that's um, good. Man. That sounds good. Cool, cool. Um, now, these next questions were compiled um, by me and Donna Newman a little while back. Um, and the first one, I just hope won't upset people because I do want to make clear to everybody uh, who will be listening to this. I I really appreciate everything Huey P. Newton did. Um, but this is a question that did, does raise concern. Uh, and the question is, how do we reconcile Huey P. Newton and his downfall 
with his revolutionary literature because his literature was truly revolutionary but you know he he seemed to have but they seemed to have gotten to him like badly um well you know the friend of, I, have a, I have a comrade who recently passed and thinking about his history I would say it's along the same lines of Huey Newton. So this isn't something that's unusual. I can say that right now. I mean, people make great contributions to the mass movement, and they take a take a turn to the left. I mean, literally turn to the right or turn downhill, and they seem to be done. So I mean, there's a. I mean, Huey P. Newton probably had so much heavy ha hanging over his head when he was in the Black Panther Party. The fact he didn't go insane is like a tribute to his stamina. Um, make it the picture after him big time. No, no doubt about it. He, I mean, he, but I do think that at a certain point, it's just this happens, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna excuse it in the sense of wow, it, it's, it isn't terrible. We would hope that our leaders wouldn't take such turns, but. Uh, everything in mind, everything in balance, he has made a great contribution to the revolutionary movement, the black revolutionary movement theory. Even if some of the, even if there's debate over the theory that came out of the Black Panther Party by Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver, I have to mention him as a theoretician because he's not talked about a lot as a theoretician. Um, whatever happened, I mean, Cleaver did the same thing, right? He, Became a yeah, he voted for Reagan. <laughs> he became a designer, became a Mormon. You know, I mean, but Cleaver made contributions. And I think at a certain point, I mean, we, we, can, theorize, we can theorize that there wasn't this firm enough practice of revolutionary theory and practice within their, within their, within them as people. I mean, there's a number of reasons we can give. I mean, I think that really the issue, I'm going to say something, I'm going to say something that I really think people don't talk about. The real issue to me was the inability of the rank and file Panther members to see, to recognize what was occurring and, and to take action. Now, there were some some police, I would say police, some enforcer elements in the Panther hierarchy that wanted to keep order, or, you know, would, would that would use uh, um, uh, armed, oh, not, violent, not pistols or guns or knives, but would use force against party members, but all the party members had to do Essentially, and that's all, it's very easy to talk about. They said, "Hey, we, you know, you know, we, we as party members don't don't like the way things going, or the direction of this organization, and we think we need a, replica a replication campaign. Kind of, kind of like what happened in China. You would need to have the party members fight back, and some did, and some quit, and you know, people people took off. I think now with that, in hindsight, that's what you have to do." If part of your leadership is not following the historically correct line of, of revolution, you have the members of the organization have to fix that, period. That's just period. It could be me. It could be you. If it's going wrong, we got to fix that. That's all. And I think I'm not blaming party members, but I think more people knew it was wrong. And if, in a few instances, like in Seattle, people broke away and formed their, you know, had a Panther Party or, uh, type organization that kept its structure kept a structure, but did not follow the party, the big Black Panther the Party. That's one example I know of. And probably happened in like other places that that, that, that like we might not know about. I mean, no one's really done a real history study of what happened to the Black, the Panther the Panther offices across the country when the party dissolved as far as its leadership. I, I, I don't know of one study looking at it. None. So I think, yeah. I mean, I think Newton, Newton's Newton's antics as he became older, as he became older also, and not leading a revolutionary movement t t tended, to, tended to deviate, but there are many leaders that have done that, man. Many. I mentioned three right now. Cleaver, Newton, uh, somebody else, I, there's another person I know of who's, who's passed recently, Great, made a lot of theoretical contributions, but at, at a certain part, they just deviate away. And I can't explain it why it happens but it does happen and when it happens people who are i hate to use the word true 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 believers but those who are true believers in social revolution have to have to make keep the path alive with or without that leader recognize their contributions keep the path alive and keep moving
and ho- and ho- hopefully the leader can can become one one of the members of the movement again and and you know get back in step. But if say, but if say the the leader doesn't do that, you can recognize what you can recognize his struggle contribution and just move on and make make necessary crit- criticism and self criticism and just move on. That's all to you with Newton and anybody else. Right on, right on. Um, I, I like how you flush out those answers answers so that there's no misunderstanding what you say. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's for sure. No problem. What oh. do you think about uh, challenging errors in Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao? I'm not, 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 not tearing them down. I'm just saying uh, challenging errors in them because that can oh. often get you in a lot of trouble with a lot of people. Oh, no, I, I think you have this. You have to just give your opinion of what you think, you know, theoretically. I, I, don't, I don't see it as a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal in a sense of where where you want to take your movement and where you want to take your 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 struggles and your your, your development of ideology. But I mean, I I books my cabinet right here. St- um, um, Blood lies, Khrushchev lies. Another couple of books. There's a guy named like Grover Fur. Now, Gro- Gro- like Grover Fur gets a rile of Trotskyites. Oh well. Okay, that's cool. No problem. What, we, what do you have to say about it? Just have a conversation. It's not about you know people ain't, ain't got to get all twisted about it. But these there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of bullshit struggle that goes on with Marxists. I think they need to come to an end. Or these I don't I don't participate in that stuff. I I make my opinion known. I read and then I try to build something. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on you know castigating somebody's line. I'm not going to do that. Because I, I, I mean, it has a point, but a certain point, building revolution is part. Of, you have to that's part of building building revolution. But you have to you have to have a proper balance also. All right, cool. Um, um, well, I mean, uh, this isn't actually on the list, but that actually uh, uh, that actually emerges in me a different question that I that I think might have some relevance. Um, in contrast to that, what do you think? Do you think it's worth it also to defend such people? Because um, we we've found that it's worthwhile to explain to people that a lot of what yeah there are things there are legitimate criticisms you can make about Joseph Stalin, but a lot of it isn't true. In fact, Stalin is not the big boogeyman that people often attribute to, and he actually did good good things. Yeah, um, I was trying to say that also. I, this just came to mind. This wasn't on the list, but in contrast to that, what do you think about defending such people? for their reputation being torn down, not because individuals are important, but because people tend to sweep aside movements because they say, oh, Stalin did this, Stalin did that. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's right, man. That's, what, that's why it's hard for me to be in a group that hates Stalin, because mm-hmm. if you hate him, I, I know if I can hang with you, if you, because I think he made some contributions, and frankly, I'm going to say something. People talk a lot of people think a lot, a lot of shit about Stalin. I'm gonna say something right now. If he wouldn't have ruled the way he ruled, Russia would have got beat by the fascists. And that's the end of that conversation. I'm sure, just, I'm sure politically, if he tracked Trotsky down to Mexico and killed him, he better have a damn good reason, man. Oh, that's a lot of fucking capital to put into kill, killing somebody. Fuck that noise. I mean, I sure, I, I sure hope it was worth it. Cause I, don't, I don't think it was. I mean. That would see that would change the whole history of how communism sees him too. Something you just don't do, man. I mean, but then again, the Bolsheviks wiped out the the royal family, right? Killed them all, including the children. Damn, it fucked them all up. That was some shit. So I guess, you know, I don't know, man. It's just I I I I would like to know more about those trials that occurred that people accused of Stalin right right in Russia over the party, the things that um. Cohen Ty talks about in the worker opposition. I think those are things you could talk about, but he was he was part of the Bolshevik Party, as was Trotsky, as was Lenin, as a whole yeah. lot, a whole lot of other people. Same thing with Huey Newton. Same thing with people like um, our our brother Ward Churchill. Man, damn, they put a hurt on him, didn't they? They fucked him up, man. I I heard Homeboy isn't even working. Well, for what it's worth, we're not we're 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 not a bunch of Stalin haters. If it if that no, helps no, anything, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying. Same thing with same thing with Mao Zedong. Um, I mean, a few, a few other, no, I'm gonna miss some names. Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, um, Ernst Mandel, Pablo, 
Moreno, um, these names that come up in these conversations. Um, I'm very happy that Cuba allowed escaped members of the, of the Black Liberation Army and Black Panther Party to live in Cuba. That doesn't mean I support everything the Cuban Revolution has done. However, I do think they kicked ass in South Africa. <laughs> I'm going to tell, right tell, tell you right now. I, 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 split with, I have split with people over Cuba and the Soviet Union and all that shit. No, I'll see it like that. That was a good thing. That was a good thing. Everybody that mentioned Africa in the 70s and 80s with the living struggles, that was wonderful. I wholeheartedly support it. We'll never denounce it. So in some circles, I I, I couldn't say that, right? I know you couldn't. You couldn't say that. Oh, it's Fidel Castro. Right on. That's good. <laughs> so I, 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 I have a very open view about um, criticism and self-criticism of historical figures. That, that, to- that coincides, I think, with combat liberalism by Mao, uh, which is something that we've been using almost like, like, a, like a mantra, but, but not in the sense of like treating it like a dogma, but that it is uh, among, among um, the eight official members and our new ninth member, um, who I say is more le- I'd say he's more or less official now, um, we are trying to do a lot of self-criticism on one another so that we can improve, you know, because to, you know, the only way to work out contradictions is through self-criticism, and um, I've received heavy criticisms that are necessary. The others have received heavy criticisms that are necessary, and I've noticed that we've been able to improve in this way. And I think that it's also important to redeem uh, past figures, whether you're talking about Trotsky or Stalin, by the way, because if you can do that, you can see where the, one of the, both of them got it wrong or got, got it right, and that exactly. can reflect on us today. Exactly, you know? exactly, exactly. You have to look at it like that. It's the only way, man. That's the only way. And yeah, yeah, right on, right, right on. Um, what do you think of uh, minority ethnic cultures and minority religious cultures today doing what we're trying to do by building in the style of the Black Panther Party? Because much of what we're doing, we're modeling after the old Black Panther Party. I've heard some people say that that's really good, but I've heard other people say you're trying to appropriate Black culture. Um, well, no, we're not trying to do that. No, don't even worry about that. I think the argument, I think the argument of appropriation has been taken way out of context. Actually, but, you know. so no, I, 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 I think, I think that there are, there are, there are, I think what you said exists. There are national minority religious cultures that exist, and for I'm concerned, they, I mean, leave, leave, leave them alone. They don't hurt nobody. I mean, if America was totally fine on that bull, on that stuff, right? And I think it's, it's just about, I'm sorry, I haven't given it that a lot of thought in my thinking, but it just sounds like, yes, there are, and, and their rights should be respected. Well, yeah, there's, um, I've me- I mentioned to you two, uh, uh, revolutionary black groups that are virtually unknown, uh, like when we, when we spoke in private. And there's also a Byzantine Catholic group that feels that they they've gone through bad history with the Roman Catholics and the Russian Orthodox. They're they're a Byzantine Catholic group, and they want to work in solidarity with people. There's also um, uh, different uh, Hindu forces that um, are skeptical of the caste system, and they they believe that oh. capitalism exploits the caste system when the ca- like they like there's a Hindu, but he was a person that used to come with me to a, a special ed school that I, that I took in my young adult life as I was trying to improve my spelling, and he struggled with spelling. But he talked to me about how he felt that Hindus had a, an uphill battle. He said because prior to capitalism come being forced on India, and he maintained it was forced on India. The caste system, people were starting to finally challenge it, and they were starting to, and they, and ironically, they were able to use the Bhagavad Gita to challenge it, and it got to the point where, you know, a lot of Hindus said, you know, the caste system was for a more way distant past thing, and now we can go beyond that. But capitalism comes and gets rid of that progression, you know, because capitalism, I'm like, ooh, caste system, perfect excuse, to, you know, to, to, you know, have class division, basically, you know, and, um, it's. Uh, I'm not trying to like bash somebody like Gandhi, but that's one of the things that I found found strange is that people keep going back to Gandhi. But Gandhi, to me, is not the best representative of Hindus because he was trying to preserve the dying caste system, which in a way he effectively helped capitalism when he did that. He helped imperialism essentially. But I I don't know like you, you I don't expect you to agree or disagree with that. But I mean I, I want to know what you think about that. I, I um you know. From what I can, what I, from what I know, I'm just gonna say from what I know, um, 
I don't like the caste system. I don't, I don't see how it's progressive. I don't see how, I don't see how it's, it's revolutionary. Just like I don't like skin tone among black people. It, but that, that's not the caste system because I think to a certain extent, racism has an element of caste, caste system within it. I think so. I think see it's just this, just keeping somebody, keeping somebody oppressed because you have some, so they're supposed to be oppressed and everybody's supposed to be oppressed within that group. That's bullshit. If that's what the caste system is, I'm not for it. Yeah. And it's amazing how many hinges you find out absolutely want to get past the caste system and they're held back literally by the state enforcing it on India. Uh, there's, I'm sure you've heard a lot, there's a lot of, uh, uh, Marxist Leninist Maoists in India, you know, trying you know, who are still doing a, a, a people's war against the capitalist system over there. Okay, well, you know, man, if, if that's the case, we need to see, we need to see the Indian state then overturn this. That, yeah. I mean, that that would be a quite legitimate. That would be a revol. That would be a that would be a revolutionary movement in India to get rid of that. To have the Indian masses rise up against it. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, ama it's amazing how many of them go out of their way to try to make contact with people in the West so that they can be visible, um, and they're often ignored, sadly. Is is it wrong to criticize the heralding of nonviolence, given the fact that this liberal liberal tactic is failing as a lifestyle in dealing with police brutality? Well, here's how I think you should handle this. I think that most people would like to resolve things peacefully through conversations, agreements, you know, I think human beings would, would prefer to handle things in that way. However, the, and the state, the capitalist state has institutions which exist to make sure the capitalist state stays in power. And one of them, one, and many of them involve the military, the destroying of property, destruction of um, infrastructure, and killing people. That's what they do. So to fight them, you, it might, it might become necessary for people to, you know, oppose it may become necessary for people to oppose it, and I think that the peaceful move to, to, to say for the ideological conviction that nonviolence is not revolutionary. I don't think that I don't think you should be ideologically convicted. I don't think you should, you should be ideologically con con convicted to not be to not use self defense methods and offense methods when necessary. The, 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 the capitalist state does that. The capitalist state does, does what it wants to do to make sure the capitalism exists. And they impose these ideas on on they have their their spokespeople, their ideological police or whatever, or or um, proselytizers to say we should well, you can never use violence. I'm not saying you should be violent, but I don't think you should take. I'm not. I don't think you should be ideologically wedged in that. It hasn't been unless 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 the workers, unless those oppressed peoples. Say this is how we're gonna walk, and we're gonna walk this way, and our revolution we want will be felt, will be waged this way. Then I could see support. It. If it came from the mass of the people through 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 the revolutionary leadership to say, hey, this is how we want to make our struggle, and this is what we're gonna do. Then you know I, I I'd have to I have to I'm I would be forced to acknowledge how how people feel about that. Mm -hmm. But I do but I do think, for example, the king the way that ML King. Is is is, saint, is given sainthood. If you like Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, and then the imprisoned Black Panthers, and imprisoned the murdered and imprisoned indigenous leaders, people from the Chicano people, the Asian people, the uh, Jewish people. You know, those leaders are not those leaders' views are never endorsed by the state unless they they philosophically are support nonviolence. No, no militant leader of any of any peoples. Even Geronimo is not honored. Geronimo is acknowledged for being a great tactician, but he still was a native man and he used guns to oppose the white the white expansion. So you know, I mean, I say it's just you know, there's it's really no brainer to me. You have to you have to be willing to embrace what you have to do to win. But most people would most people would prefer, prefer to do things peacefully. I think. I, th I think I just think people would sit down. That's that's the preferred way of resolving conflicts. I think. Now this this next question is probably going to be the slightly most long long winded. So if you could bear with me a little bit, uh, what do you think about groups that, while holding to a Marxist Leninist or a Marxist Leninist Maoist line, borrowing from Trotsky, anar 
anarchist theorists and alternative socialists like Gaddafi, is this uh, deviation or can this be acknowledged as simply just not being dogmatic? It's just, I, I think it's more than not being dogmatic. It's, it's opening your mind to learn things. So you got to read to learn things. you got to open your mind to learn things. So, you know. Right on. I, I love I love how engaged you are w with these questions. I really appreciate that. And I told Dr. Weisfeld that he had watched the documentary and he liked it. He said that that was very humbling for a Black Panther to appreciate our work. What revolutionary literature should we take from the Panthers? Hmm, let's see. I think both of their 10-point programs were okay, except for, the, except for the part about the United Nations. That's... It should have called for a revolutionary movement. A black people was from a revolutionary party. One demand should have been a revolutionary, black people from a revolutionary party. So I think that's the only part about the 10-point program. I think it's like a transitional program. Let me see what else. I think that the early rise of Huey Newton that were published on by Rampart's books would be good to get. Those, those, are early, those are early books. The Ideology of the Black Panther Party by Elvis Cleaver is very important. Well, nobody talks about it too much. Um, also, the writings of Emory Douglas, the drawings of Emory Douglas, I think it's important to study also the drawings. I even said probably one of the more important things to study is the art and culture. So records of Elaine Brown, uh, records of Elaine Brown, music of a group called the, the Lumpen, any of the groups that derive from the Black Panther Party, and, uh, musical groups. I would look at the poetry. I think that those various expressions of black revolutionary thought are what are the most important, I think. The, I hate to say it, but the iconography and the music and the, um, yeah, the political thinking. But I think if that got brought up more within the conversation, you asked me about it. I think that would have impact today, quite frankly. One of my favorite books, I used to have a copy of it, but I lost it, was actually uh, Soul and Ice by Eldridge Cleaver. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think that's a good book to read, actually. I, it, it's funny, though, because he, he wrote my favorite song, and then he endorsed the person he was dissing, my favorite song, uh, Fuck Ronald Reagan, and then he voted for Ronald Reagan, so that's kind of funny. It just, it just shows you, man, these guys can take these weird, these, these turns, man. And say, and say it, like, that's like in, in Zimbabwe. Look at the Zimbabwe, they, they, a coup d'etat in, in a black nation in Africa of against Mugabe. I mean, their whole, that whole, all the revolutionary movements would agree that coup is not the solution, but they allowed it to happen in there. So it, it, again, these things happen historically. These contradictory things happen historically. And it just shows that the class forces inside those movements have changed, to me, in uh, the wrong direction. So that's saying same, 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 same thing with Cleaver. I mean, have, have you ever been to the, to the capital of Cal California? The capital? No, um, I, I've not really been to California. Yeah. I've driven through California, and, and I, I regret this. I've been to quite a few places, but I've not been to California. Well, the, the reason why I ask you that is that there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a statue of Ronald Reagan in the, in the bottom of the Capitol, on the fourth floor. They, they celebrate him becoming president. They celebrate him becoming a president of the United States and being a governor. That's amazing to me. I had no idea such a vicious statue existed should be torn down the same way like the, the Southern Step is right there. So here you have. I mean, imagine Ellis El Cleaver de denounced this man, threatened threatened to duel with Ronald Reagan, and here he is voting for him. Isn't that something? Wow, that's that, that's amazing. I mean, this is like the first massive legislative gun control came from yes. Reagan. And I mean, and I keep, one of the things that we we and, never meant to become make it a slogan, but we're starting to use it as a slogan. Gun control is right wing. We keep trying to push that forward. Gun yeah, control yeah, is yeah. right wing. It is. Yeah. Should should we uh should should we learn from Malcolm X, Stokely Clark, Michael, and H. Rat Brown? That's the next question. Yep, sure, sure. I, I, I even say that those, what's, what's so, what's so telling about those gentlemen is they did not go on the deviation path of Newton. Isn't that interesting? And yet we want to get, yeah. In, 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 yeah, people, people, I mean, they didn't. Stokely Carmichael, 
whatever you like, like or dislike about the All African People's Revolutionary Party, he he, 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 he maintained that stance till he died. H. Rap Brown is in jail. Why? For fighting off a police attack against him in 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 in, uh, Alabama, in, in Georgia. That's that was self defense straight up. That's all he's in jail for. And plus, man, because he's H. Rap Brown, they kicked him in jail. Who else? Um, H. Rap Brown, so you got my go. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Oh, Malcolm X surpassed Huey Newton by 10,000 leagues, man. Yes, he did, man. Malcolm X was murdered for being Malcolm X. He didn't even hit the drugs, so I don't see why we would even focus on dissing Newton. Just focus on promoting those people who have a great history we can never talk about them being deviated from. Focus on them. The parents, right. I mean, or give them their their due. Right. They did right not. On. None of them have even took those paths, man. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Well, I also don't feel like it's 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 healthy to diss New, uh, Hugh P. Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, or even Bobby Seale. In fact, I still love Bobby Seale. I just think that he's a bit too reformed. But yeah. I, 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 yeah. I cherish Bobby Seale, and I love it when Bobby Seale goes out to activist groups and talks because it, it, they, they get more they, – they believe more in their activism, get more radical when he shows up. So it's the same thing when Angela Davis shows up, you know, too. Right, like, right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Occupy Wall Street had a lot of liberalism, and, and you know there's a there's a history behind Occupy Wall Street that I'm one of the few people who know where it stemmed from before it happened actually in Zuguti Park because it actually started in 2008. It just became very popular in Zuguti Park, and they and everybody caught on to it. But what I noticed is what gave it any sense of longevity and curbed away as much li- it didn't succeed it still became a liberal movement but which is very sad but what what allowed it to develop any radicalism was the fact that angela davis did show up uh uh bobby seal did show up and bobby seal told his famous story about the 10 point program with him and huey and everybody cheered you know because you know and and that that i think is what gave it any longevity at all had they not showed up i think that it just would have been you know because it, it kind of failed in a way but it had a longevity, I think, because they showed up. So I don't believe in dissing anybody, you know, because I yeah. don't think that it's healthy. You're right. You're right. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, how would you raise COINTELPRO awareness? Well, hmm. well, first of all, you have to promote the book, The Writings of War Churchill. You have to constantly keep that book in people's thinking and learn from that book. I think in political education, as far as materials we need to use for political education, that that book is essential. The um, reports from the government are essential to have. The, those ones that we can get, the ones that um, church committee, those documents. But more more importantly, is that we have to, have to use proper. We have to believe in ourselves and know ourselves well enough to keep our movement alive, and it's going to be attacked on different levels. And one level is the level of spying and creating charges to, to decapitate our movement. Spying and creating um, conspiracy to decapitate our movement. Those are two things that we have to be aware of. Um, you know, our phone calls, our security, using proper security, our phone calls, things we talk about, things we don't talk about. I mean, but ultimately, if we're about the revolutionary movement, we can overcome the, the counterintelligence. You just have to overcome it. You, you can't let that. You can't let the counterintelligence. And I'm using that's the word that they use: counterintelligence. The counterintelligence programs have to be thwarted because our movement has to thrive. So right on, right on. you have to study how they do things. No, I, I think you should know who's doing it. Quite frankly, what agency the government does. I, I think you should know the name of, of the agencies. I do. I don't think you should say, "Oh, the amorphous secret police." No. That office does this, this office does that. We should know who they are. Should have their pictures, know their history, know their strategies that they publicize. I think I think it's something we need to do right away in this country. Um, but in general, I think counterintelligence has to be acknowledged that it exists to attack our movement. And that's why, yeah, I'm going to say something. I'm not trying to start no shit. But when the, when the FBI leader comes talking, come talking to you, you run his ass out of, run his or her ass out of, out of the room. Politically, I mean, James Comey should have had no influence over, 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 over the revolutionary over the working class. James Comey's a pig, driven to the FBI. Mueller is a pig, driven to the FBI. But the FBI hasn't been 
the, 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 the federal government agencies in the heart of people who are aware, they know they are the enemy of, of the revolution. But it's something that is hard for the masses to grab a hold of that they're just not against criminals. Sometimes that's, that's a problem because everybody wants law and order. But, you know, but, you know, and to, and it's just going to be safe in their environs. And they, they it, incorrectly connect the police with making that possible. But the FBI and the CIA, Blackwater, private firms, you know, intelligence agencies in there. Look at what happened in, look at what happened in Standing Rock. It's a classic recent counterintelligence operation. Yes, it was, man. The way those security forces came in there and um, um, that those private firms were used to militarily attack Standing Rock activists and their times in jail, all the stuff that happened to them, that was counterintelligence. The movement, the movement was righteous. The movement was right, one of the few move, righteous movements just like I, 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 I Occupy Wall Street. People showed up spontaneously or from different tendencies. To, to give support, but the core movement was among the the native people. You know, so they, they, so people like the red was it the red something tribe. Um, there are a couple of very that names that stand out about being being progressive within those more radicalized and other parts of that movement. And when when those private security forces came there, that was that was the result of counterintelligence. That's when they showed up. So anyway, you know that's how I see that. That's why I see see counterintelligence within 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 the within the within the, within the urban movements. The just the, the just the, whenever there's a mass uprising, there is or even mass. I still think that the the community relations service shows up, and that that that's part of the first wing of, of counterintelligence. When they show up on the scene after rebellion, the community relations service is set help set up the set, help set up help set up counterintelligence against. The, the, the mass movements. Right, right. You know, um, and I'm glad. I'm so glad that you watched uh, our documentary, Jewish uh, Bundist Diaspora Movement, um, where we cover not just you know our uh, we not just cover our chairman, Dr. Weisfeld, but uh, the uh, who we consider the leaders of our generation, the Nateri Carter International. Um, if you recall, at the at the end of it, we bring up count. Uh, we're raising COINTELPRO awareness, and one of the things that we tried to convey. Um, in the script, and I, I tried my best to, to, to put an emphasis on this, is that what we see is that it has to be bigger than it was before. People keep talking about it in the past tense, but how can you say that after the Snowden revelations especially? I mean, forget all of WikiLeaks and uh, Manning uh, just for a second. Like, Snowden's revelations really drove that stuff home. You know, I mean, he's in it's asylum cool. in Russia because, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. you can't... And, and the whistleblowers, when they came out, I mean, in Decade for Struggle, an old uh, documentary, um, one of the guys who was part of Black Death said when he left, it was getting more advanced, and he was sure that it's going to be bigger now than it is before. So if we take that into context with what happened to Snowden, it has to be humongous at this point. Yeah, and, that, and yeah, and that's a real problem. Well, I think their collection efforts are humongous. That's true. Um. I don't know to the I don't know to the extent to which their collection efforts and their counterintelligence work have been successful. I mean, in some movements it clearly has been successful, but in others we just don't know. They have a lot of intelligence, but for example, in 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 the DPRK, they have a lot of intelligence against the DPRK. They have, they're putting sanctions sanctions on the DPRK, but they haven't yet won that struggle. So I think that you know, there's kind of there's kind of COINTELPRO still exists, but I think the power of the people is greater than the man. Like the old, the old saying, the power of the people is greater than the man's technology. And I think that's we got to keep that in mind too. That because they have, right you know, we we, could, we, have to, we have to acknowledge what they have, but we we have to still have have a movement. We we, we you know we have to still fight. And yes, they're, yes they're, we do. Yeah. And their technology can't be a hindrance to us fighting. It just, it just can't be. You know, we have to, we, 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 we have to just build our movements. If we build our movements, the technology won't stop it. 
it may help hamper it, but I don't think it'll stop our movements. But, you know, look at China. They have, they're, they're, they're able to stop movements there. That's damn sure they got that shit hooked up in China. So maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. We'll see. So from Isaiah P. Cometstein, our councilman of committees, he says, Greetings, comrade. I want to know what you think the correct method is concerning dealing with police brutality in the United States and, and how do we bring about Afro-unity. Uh, remember, he's, this is our Jewish black member. He says, he says uh, and how do we bring about Afro-unity? Disconnect between blacks and our African relatives is higher than it was when I was younger. How do we build bridges between black nationals and Africans when black people are trying to hold on to utopian attempts at entry into the white power structure? Bourgeois blacks, to me, are no better than white capitalist bourgeoisie. Okay, well, as far as um, the, the development of the better ties between African Americans and Africans, um, Very good, very, it's a very good question. I don't think it's, I think we need to have I think we need to have I think we need greater discussion about the issue and come up with some solutions. Um, yeah, I think that I think that needs that 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 would be good in, in resolving that issue, or that would be good in addressing that issue. Having some discussions among those who feel is an issue who feel. Those who recognize the challenge, to sit down and discuss the challenge, come up with and come up with some solutions. That's all I can say about that. Because I think that's that's my real thing. That's my thought about that that particular question. As far as um, division between blacks and and blacks and and Africans or a, a Africans and African Americans, I think that if people work together and deal with each other as human beings, like I said earlier. And those problems don't even exist. Because once you do somebody in a certain a certain way, that's when you start having those problems. Well, people who, who people who deal with each other as sisters and brothers, that's not, that's not really a major issue. But you know, the fact that I think that what you could, well, I think one thing you might want to look at in African Americans is do we do, do African Americans? Um, Acknowledge that their thinking is affected by being in U.S. imperialism. I'm not saying because it's imperialism they have bad thinking. No, I don't know what I'm not saying that. But like because somebody lives in France, they do have um, they have the ability to develop. They have great, great pressure on them to develop ideas toward the third world that are reactionary and toward immigrants that are reactionary. Yes, they do. But that doesn't mean they have to be reactionary toward the third world. So any kind of, any kind of issues between Africans and African Americans can be resolved if, if we both consider ourselves human beings and people who have uh, just as people, I think that's, I, mean, I think, you know, I think black Americans have been here a long time and it's easy to get, to get caught up in, you know, anti, anti African sentiment since historically Africa has been seen as a, as, an, as a very negative place. I mean, it's, I mean, I think Africa is, is still projected as a very negative place and very deprived place. And I think that black Americans some hold those views too. That's probably true. Not everybody, but it has to be. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to say that it's not an issue. I like to say it doesn't exist. I resolve it. I don't know. Conversation, collective ideas. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and our next uh, one is from Marvin Eliyahu, our councilman of World Forums. Uh, he says. Is it fair to say that pantherism is on the rise and that people power could free the world from colonialism? Okay, it, um, I think it's fair to say that a mass, that a movement does exist among 
uh, among large sections of black people against police terror and oppression. I don't know, call it pantherism, but yes, I think that is, I think that is growing. Yes, I do. Okay. And um, the next one is from Hannah Tuff. She's our councilwoman of strategic projects. She says, how do we save ourselves from the exploitation by the state of Israel? They speak in our name. Jewish Europeans like myself feel that we must emancipate ourselves from the neo-colonial propaganda of Israel. But the same can be said of the liberal organization Jewish Voice for Peace. They don't seem to understand that our, centris, our centrism or liberalism, as what I, you know, to clarify what she means by that, I'm pretty sure she's referring to liberalism. Centrism, which is centrism, anyways, our centrism in the 50s, 60s, and 70s furthered the strangling of the true Jewish left. Had we made the Bundist movement when the Black Panther Party and the American Indian movement was forming, the world we live in may have looked differently, and there may not have even have been an apartheid Zionist state in our present time. And we may have achieved a world socialist revolution. What should we, what should we in the Jewish Bund do about this today? <laughs> I think mean, you should move forward within the context of the current situation. Just move forward. You should move forward. Just start start where you are and move forward. Build build your theory, develop your understand history and move forward. That's what you should do. All right, right, right on. Um, this one next one is from Miriam Emmisberg, our councilwoman of education. She says, Hello, Steve Struggle. If we don't stop the neo-Nazi terrorists, we are doomed. So melodramatic. Is electoral politics no longer an option? Is legal deterrence by use of video cameras and legal firearms the way to go? I am totally fine with this idea, but is this even practical? I would like, I would like to think that you support the people's right to self-defense. I'm sure that you do. Yet social media that challenges American corporate media is getting censored all the time. What is your advice to the Bundist movement? Okay. As far as the censorship thing goes, one, develop alternative forms of social media that can reach the masses. And always be, will always be ready and willing to go door to door and face to face and talk to people. That's how you do the social, the, the, the censorship. As far as the neo-Nazis and the fascists, okay. I think they are a security threat. I think that the spreading of the lack of effective challenge to white supremacist ideas and neo-Nazis ideas is, is troubling. Um, if we build our mass movements along the correct is issues in politics and philosophy, we challenge the neo-Nazis' ability to move. Our main thing now is to move, to get get move, get busy, grow, have our foundations, our foundations in place, and remember things will take will take some time. I think that's the best way to approach them: be a neo-Nazis. Um, you know, they have a, they had a setback recently, um, a legal setback, but um, they do they do constitute a threat. They do. Okay. All right, and um, this uh, last one here is from Uri Adia, our councilman of national affairs. Mm -hmm. With respect to all of our most genuine anarchist allies, how do we show them that anarchism is theoretically broken and has been now for some time? I don't want to pull rank, but I'll pull rank here. If you don't want to answer that one, you don't have to answer that one. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think you should worry about it. Worry about it, actually. I think that you can have your critique of what, like you have a critique of communism and religion, you have some critiques of communist theory inside your your inside your slide inside your slideshow, right? 
Uh, yeah. Y- y- yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and we don't yeah. hate anarchists. I don't know why Uri felt like that was a necessary question, but you know. No, I... no, no, no. It's it's okay. It's okay. I mean, that's something he wants to talk about. That's cool. That's that's cool. I mean, that's that's, that's totally cool. Um, I just think that you should maybe extend such a recording and bring up your concerns about anarchism within that recording. But I thought you did have a very good analysis of anarchism actually having more of a communist a communist uh, orientation than a reactionary orientation. I thought your video did a very good job of that, quite frankly. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. We, we have a critique yeah, of communism as not being a bad thing per se, but that we, we find its origins, whether anarchist or Marxist, to have been Eurocentric in, in, uh, in its origins. And that's not to, it's not meant as a sectarian move. We will definitely work with I don't communists. Know. Yeah, no, no. I know. I'm, 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 no, um, I understand that. And that's cool. It's, it's not even. So you're basically saying that, you know, you don't really think that we need to, like, educate the mess to what's wrong with their theory per se we just you know add that to our critique our, our one of many critiques i'm guessing is what you mean by that yeah and also just keep building your movement i think if, if people want to support your movement eventually they're, they're going to have to come to grips with things in their ideology that prevent them from doing more to support you that's usually what it comes down to but you know i i i just think that the more to me my focus will be building in our movement, I mean, and you know, and the really support among broad sections of people, or and particularly Jewish people, you know, that's how we think. We feel that we're not going around in circles, but we're going through some, I guess you could say, theoretical roadblocks because we can't scrap what Marxists and anarchists have said because. They are, I mean, communists are socialists, for, you know, obviously, and they, they did a lot of the contributions that were necessary. But we also find that at the same time, it isn't just dealing with, you know, um, communist political cousins, but it's it's dealing with different strands of, of theory and, you know, the sectarian, like, we don't call for left unity, but we definitely call for anti-sectarianism, but we find that sectarianism is stronger now in a more unnecessary way, you know, whereas maybe sometimes it might be necessary because this person might be too reactionary or, or actually be cryptically fascist or something. You have those situations, but sometimes that's not the situation at all, you know, and, you know, uh, it's getting harder and harder even to sit down with certain groups, you know, in some senses. In other ways, though, it's growing, but it's growing from people who I've noticed have not made up their mind about a lot of things, which... I don't know what you think about that, but, you know, people who don't necessarily already have their mind made up or are just open to absorbing as much information as they can and making an evaluation, those seem to be the people that are the most on par with anything. You know, man, I, I mean, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm okay with what, you, what you're saying. I'm okay with that. I like how you say our movement. I, I'm guessing you're collecting with us – and you as as a larger we and I and I kind of appreciate that. Um, well, yeah, well, I do think we have uh, some definite some definite um, principles of unity and things we agree on, even at the realm of of ideology and philosophy. That's very good. Yeah, it's 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 it's. I think it's time to, as you've put it, more than once, move. I think we need to move forward, um, and we need to get the ball rolling. I mean, we've started already with a lot of stuff, but as we uh, progress, we, we've noticed that there needs to be, you know, there needs to be more strategy. I mean, Hannah works on strategy, um, and she's still in development of it. But we're also at the thing where we realize if we don't get our manifesto out, people are not going to understand where we're coming from. So we're we're, we're, we're we're almost done with it, more or less. But at the same time, it hasn't covered the entire theory. And at the same time, theory and practice is important. So we have to worry about practice. Our newest member, because we're like I said, we're going to have a uh, four new ministers. Um, the, we've already got the first one, um, so his first name's Daniel. He he keeps stressing, and everybody has read it except me, except I started reading it. Everybody has read, everybody except uh, myself and Abram Weisfeld has read the book Settlers, from what I understand. And Daniel says we've got to read Settlers, especially if we're making a large critique of the American colonial structure. Would you agree that since since I, he didn't ha- I didn't get a time to take a question from him, I'm, I'm just going to take what I would think he would, would want to ask. Do you think Settlers is an important book? I think it's important to read Settlers. 
I don't think settlers by itself is sufficient to develop an act, to develop a critique of the historical, ideological, and political development of the United States. But I think settlers is very important, and it's not given the importance that it's due. I, I just I, I I have to read it again recently and to critique it in my currently way of seeing things. But overall, as I remember, it's basic it's basic premises about the you know, white settler colonialist view of white people in white America. I think that that's I think it's a, it's a, it's an important contribution, and we but you have to you have to um, I think you have to um, go beyond, make that part of your analysis. Just make, keep that in mind when you make your analysis. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind when you make your analysis. That's all. Steve Struggle, thank you so much for coming here. And I hope it's not too cliche, but we've been saying it a lot because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a phrase we feel. I'd like to say all power to the people. All power to the people. All, all power, power to, the to the people. Right on. Thank you so much for coming here. I hope maybe at some time in the future we can come again. And I, 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 I'm sure you've been, you're very busy with things. And so for you to talk. Uh, let me get a chance to read some more of your materials. Uh -huh. And uh, give me about a week or two. No, give me up, up to two weeks. And uh, I'll be back in touch with you. I will be. Right on, right on. Thank you so much, man. All power to the people. Okay, bro. Thank you.